Welcome to the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show. I'm your host, Dan Breslin, and this is episode 166 on self-storage redevelopment with Scott Crone. If you are into real estate investing and building wealth, congratulations, you are in the right place. My role here on the REI Diamond Show is to invite guests who specialize in building wealth, such as real estate investors and other industry service providers, and draw out the jewels of wisdom. Those tactics, mindsets, and methods used to create millions of dollars and more in the business of real estate. On this episode, Scott and I dig deep into his retrofit self-storage redevelopment model. We discuss the capital stack, the investor splits, the market selection, even a unique structure that he's used to finance a redevelopment with just 15% equity. So essentially, it's a 15% down loan for development of self-storage. Self-storage is a favorite among investors for its performance historically during turbulent economic times, which are now upon us. To timestamp this episode, we are recording at the end of September 2020, or roughly six months after the coronavirus pandemic essentially shut down the economy. Scott's background in development began while in school for architecture, working with Optima, a large architecture design and build firm throughout the Chicago region. So he has since founded Coda Management and done design, build, real estate coaching, uh, management, among other things, to where he is now focused on redeveloping self-storage facilities in warehouse structures throughout the Midwest. So let's begin. All right. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity being um, on your podcast and re- talking with you and your in your community. So thank you very much for having me on here. Yeah, for sure. I was excited. The booking agents were working to get us in touch. And it's always uh, exciting when I get somebody who's uh, doing business, living in uh, my one of my backyards. I'm living in Chicago, but our company operates in Atlanta and Philadelphia, too. So anytime we kind of get a local guy, even if he's not in our single family fix and flip type of a space, I always get excited. So for listeners who may not know about uh, you, Scott, or Coda Management, do you want to kind of give the origination story, how you sort of got in real estate and how your career developed to what you're doing today? Absolutely, man. Pleasure. Um, I got I got into real estate sort of happenstance in terms of, um, you know, falling into it. Um, I got, you know. Our, we had a family business that was in die castings, and I always assumed growing up that I would be fourth generation. You know, my great grandfather started it. My father was also an, an uncle. We were both involved with my grandfather, and I thought I was going to be in the, in the die casting world. And um, senior year, my uh, the fall of my senior year for parents weekend, my parents showed up and said, um, "You know, what do you plan on doing next year?" And I'm like, "Well, I figured I'd be going into die casting." And they said, no, no, you're not going to do that. <clears throat> and, you know, after the awkward, you know, pause of a couple minutes, you know, I got the gumption to say, well, did I do something wrong? Am I, you know, am I not worthy to work in the family business? Did, is grandpa, you know, pissed at me? Or what's the deal? And I learned that they were selling the business. You know, and, and when your whole world is wrapped around a family business, you know, not, when I say that, not in an unhealthy way, but you grew up every you know, your dad, your uncle, your grandfather all go to work at the same place. It's a part of your culture. It's a part of your life. It's a part of learning to be an entrepreneur. Um, and, you know, that that really shook my world. And, and, you know, immediately my dad, you know, changed the focus back to architecture, um, which is what I pursued in high school, and I really enjoyed it. But I chose the school that I did because I was recruited for sports um, to play college soccer. And I was a little bit concerned that if I went to a tech school, it would be a little bit boring and I wouldn't know what to do with myself. And so I, I chose soccer. I chose a liberal arts, but I thought I'd close the door to architecture. <clears throat> and um, they, the architectural world just came out with an accreditation process for someone who was like myself that didn't have an undergraduate in architecture, but, you know, was looking to pursue it at a master's level. 
And so I was able to to transition into that and, uh, and apply and get into um, the School of Architecture at Illinois Institute of Technology, which was the biggest blessing that I'd ever thought I, you know, have received in the sense that I didn't realize how much more I was getting into when I got accepted into it. It's one of those things that you, you don't understand the full magnitude of it. And the reason why I say that is my, my professor was not only an architect, he was a real estate developer and a contractor. <clears throat> and I was his TA. And as part of that, he would make me work in his office. And so I, you know, one semester in, I'm already learning not only the architectural side of things, I'm really learning the development side of things, I'm learning the construction management side of things, and really how to facilitate a huge development. I mean, the projects we were, the first project I was working on was my master's thesis was a 400 unit, $100 million project that was condominiums, townhomes, and single family homes. And I worked on that for six years, including some other projects for him during that period of time. So it was, you know, a baptism by fire, if you will, in terms of uh, learning, you know, real estate. And that's, that's how I got into real estate. So we, uh, I did a little background homework on some of your bio and, and it, is it okay for me to say who the art, the firm was that you were working for? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I mean, I, cool. I was working for, they were a top 20 uh, company in the, in the country. It was called Optima Incorporated. And, um, at that point in time, they were, um, a developer locally in Chicago, but then subsequently after I left, they, apparently I was holding them back and, uh, but they went to, <laughs> uh, the, the Phoenix market and really expanded wealth in the Chicago and the Phoenix market. So I, I have my own Optima story. Originally, Scott, the listeners probably know and are bored of hearing the story, but I moved to Chicago from Philadelphia so that I could be near my daughter. She's 18, just went back to Philly this year, and she's in college. But for the last five years since I got here, that was the purpose, the reason, my mission, and why I landed in Chicago. I tried back in 2011 to make that move, and uh, I was bankrupt from the you know 2006, got in real estate, by 2011, I'm down to like my, you know, my last dollars and I'm like renting a room here in the Chicago market trying to get established so I could be near my daughter at the time. And I remember driving by this one building over there. I'm, I'm sure it was after you had already parted ways with Optima, but the, uh, Optima Old Orchards Woods is the, uh, mm -hmm. is the building. And, you know, okay. I was going through a little bit of a spiritual quest personally at the time, like looking for God. So everything, you know, to me was a sign and I look up. And there's like, they must have just finished construction and doing a lease up. And there's a big sign that says, yes, you can live here. And to me, that was like God saying, yeah, you're going to make it here in Chicago. And like, fast forward, you know, eight, nine years, my life is truly a blessing. But, uh, man, that was a humbling spot. And to, to put it in perspective for people, so like the Optima developments are like, they're, they're really nice. I mean, that old Orchard Woods and there's a couple of them in downtown Evanston. I mean, they're, they're class A buildings and they're big. I mean, the Optima must be four or 500 units. So it's, these are no small, uh, architectural feats for a grad student. So it's kind of saying something that about your, like you said, the luck, serendipity and the opportunity that you ended up, uh, kind of getting to, getting to be a part of. That's really cool. So, so how did you make the shift into what you're doing now, which from what I gather is mostly self storage? repositioning of existing structures, right, Scott? That is. So while, while working for Optima, you know, I, I really got to see, I mean, as I was the only student who had a, knew how the ability to read and write because everybody else was just strictly, you know, undergraduate draftsmen, I got, <laughs> you know, forced into the development side of things. And so I, I really learned the business side, not just the design side. So you know, at the the very ripe age of 28, with all the confidence in the world, or probably all the ignorance in the world, I started Coda as as, as a design build developer, and we began doing you know predominantly single family, but then we got into multifamily. We've we've actually done five churches during this period of time, and you know everything as as you experienced, everything came to a crash in 08, 09. And as a result of that, you know, there was just absolutely no lending on single family or multifamily new construction or development or anything along those lines. And everybody was was directed towards um, apartments. But we were seeing an incredible cap compressions in terms of that because of the market became so tight as that was the only vehicle in which people could deploy um, resources or assets or, you know, stay involved in, in real estate. And I was coaching real estate at the time 
um, I, I stopped teaching at Illinois Institute of Technology and I, I transitioned to coaching real estate. And I had a client that wanted to stress self storage and I, and I, I could not find it. You know, I literally, you know, for probably a year, year and a half working with him, trying to define distress cell storage, I couldn't find it. And we began working on a development for a commercial uh, tenant for a property in River Grove, uh, on River, Ro- River Road in River Grove, which is hard to say very fast, and um, just south of the O'Hare Airport. And the mayor was working with us in terms of getting the entitlements, the zoning for the property. And the, you know, during the entire meeting, she just kept verb, not verbally saying yes, but she just kept nodding. And as we left, you know, the city planner was like, isn't that great? She gave you your approval. And, you know, in the back of my head, I'm like, you know, she never really said yes. And Mm -hmm. a couple months later, she came back and said, you know, I've changed my mind. I just can't support this project. And, you know, we were like, oh, my gosh, what do we do now? I said, you know, at first I was like, Thank you. We, you know, thank you for telling us now versus like, you know, nine months into this entitlement process. Um, if we find another use, would you support it? She goes, absolutely. I'll do whatever I can to help you out. And I called up my client. I said, Hey, look, I got this 90,000 square foot warehouse. I don't know if it's right for self storage. You know, this is, you, you've been studying this. I, you know, obviously I've been coaching you in terms of like what to look for, but in terms of, you know, the feasibility, the, the financial side of it, that's where you have your, your experts that you've been working with, you know, would this property make sense for you? And so they came in, they did, they researched the property, they, 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 you know, did a market feasibility study on it. They understood the, what was going on with it. And they said, it's perfect, but we don't have anyone to, to, to entitle it and develop it for us. And I said, well, you know, we can do that. And that's how I got involved in, uh, self storage. In fact, you know, we did a wholesale there. We sold off you know, half the building to them. We leased out the other half. We had rental income coming in. We designed and built the thing. And then when we were done, we flipped the whole thing to Compass, including the original half. And then Compass wanted our additional space as well. And so we flipped the whole building to them. So I I literally had every single type of transaction that we could have in that one single deal. And that's how we got into self-storage. And and the reason why I like self-storage and I've gone in that model is because of the predictability the understanding of the demographics, looking at um, the market, understanding what our market share is, because we look at a very specific, you know, radius of, you know, three to five miles within that specific property. And it's very much predictable. It's it's so much more predictable than, you know, understanding of the, the single family or the multifamily buyer or renter. You know, are they going to like blue? Are they going to like red? Are they going to like purple? Who knows, right? In self-storage, that we take the Henry Ford model, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. With us, it's like you can have any color locker you want as long as it's white. And, you know, if you want a 5x5 five five or a 5x7 five or a 10x10, ten ten, it's just it's just a lot more predictability within the model. And and literally, at a fraction of the, of the cost basis, you know, that $100 million project that I worked on, that was revenue. Our, and it's 400 units. We have eight. 800 rental units and our cost will be below $8 million. And so for us, it's just, it's a fraction of what we could do on the multifamily side. Yeah. A lot of good stuff there. It's, it's funny as you're saying it. I mean, you obviously had a different mind map, the experience with Optima going into a deal like that. I mean, we closed, we're at the end of September here. We've closed 181 deals for close to $5 million in profit this year in my company. And that's a high volume of deals, and they're single family, and I'm comfortable with our risks there. We make money on most and lose money on a few. But when you describe that first deal, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, just feels like the abyss. It just sounds like a completely different language. And, you know, recognizing for me and and why I kind of share this, like, little bit of a tangential story, I think a lot of listeners and I think a lot of people – with shiny object sim- syndrome, Scott, it's like, oh, wow, yeah, develop, you know, self-storage. I could go run and do that. Oh, let me get into multifamily and raise $10 million and buy. Uh, at least that's how I used to think when I first got into business. It was like, I'm not going to stop until I have like four or five skyscrapers, you know, no less than 5,000 apartments, like these grandiose dreams, right? And maybe you didn't succumb to that because you had a very unique, realistic, and, and special path to be in, you know, introduced to the real estate business the way that you were. Um, but it, it just goes to show I'm a big fan of accurate thinking. 
Scott. And so for me, accurate thinking is understanding for me, my assets, a lot of that's like experience, my starting place, maybe it's the contacts I have when I come into the business. Um, and you brought a very unique set of those skills to the table too, that you were comfortable to pull the trigger and walk through that entire deal with the team that you guys had there. And now, you know, fast forward six, seven, eight, nine deals later, um, I'm sure it feels like riding a bike to you. Well, there's definitely a pattern, like in, in all businesses, right? And, and it, it's it's developing those systems. And that, that moves you, you know, when you first get into it, you're learning transactionally how to do it. But now, as I'm sure you're aware of that, once you create those systems, then you can train others and you can move up into it. And so now at the point in time where I'm no longer really working as directly in the business as more on the business, like where's the business going to be headed? How are we going to get there? What is our strategies for that? You know, it's, it's more transformational type thinking versus transactional thinking. And, you know, but it, it took a great deal of effort and, and time to set those to set those procedures, those policies, those things in place so that I could train others and then those people could then train others to take their jobs. So everyone in our, in our company, you know, we, we hired, um, a, a construction, you know, someone, a superintendent and he, and he was a sous chef and a wholesaler. And, you know, his first day of work, I'm like, okay, we're going to have a concrete inspection. I want you to show up. This is what you're going to look for. This is what you're going to do. And just make sure that it's done, you know, to these, to this standard. And he's like, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, I drew it out for him. I explained it to him. I said, just go with it. You know, it will be fine. You're going to do great. And now he's bidding out, you know, $20 million worth of work. And he's, he's overseeing other people that are running our jobs across the Midwest. And, you know, we're bringing in an intern to work underneath them. But the idea is that that person would then be trained to take over what he's doing and he would be then facilitating greater things. And, and that's ultimately what we're all looking to do is how to improve our businesses to make sure that they grow, but grow appropriately. And I think that's what you were referring to in your, your story. Yeah. And we're, we're doing a lot of that same kind of a thing where we're, uh, systematizing and creating different kind of, kind of like uh, next level positions for the people who might have started in our organization with restaurant backgrounds, just like uh, your guy. So let, let's take a turn here, if you would, with me. I checked out a property that you would probably recognize the address, 1750 North Lawndale. Um, and as an example of market selection, so one of the things I, I try to talk about with guests often here on the show is like, how do we look at a market? How do we select the market? And when I talk about Lawndale, this is in an area that I've talked about on other shows that's near the 606 Trail in a neighborhood, Humboldt Park here in Chicago, where we've seen prices skyrocket. And you bought there, looking back, probably at the right time. So I'm curious, did you have inside information uh, you know, did you, <laughs> I don't know that you're allowed to admit to inside information, but, um, you know, what information did you consider? How did you find that deal? How did you select the market? Because you bought it at just the right time and it's a high quality asset and a high quality area. Now, fast forward, you know, three, four, five years later, it's hard to touch anything in that area. So can you talk about how you identified and spotted that opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when people ask us, you know, how do we source deal? It, it, there's not just one way in which we do it. We have lots of funnels, like, you know, sources that come into our funnel. And one of them is, is brokers. So on this specific one, I was actually selling my multifamily. And the broker was saying, like, well, why are you selling your multifamily? And I'm like, well, I feel that we're at a point where the cap rate is compression is at its ultimate you know, tight. So to me, this is the opportune time to sell my multifamily. But more importantly, we're focusing on self storage. So I'm looking for like empty warehouses. And um, he said, well, I have one. And I said, well, where is it? So no, I did not have insider information like uh, most things that happen in the city of Chicago. <laughs> but it was, you know, just telling people what we're doing so that people, you know, begin bringing you deals. And, you know, Perhaps, you know, we see, I, I get 10 deals every day that come across my desk. But, you know, as they say on that commercial, like, stick to your lane, bro. You know, for us, I know what I'm specifically looking for. And so we can, we can knock off of them, a lot of them rather quickly because they don't, they don't meet our criteria. 
So when he brought me the, the warehouse, the first question I have is, well, why is it empty? Why, what's going on there? And they said, well, the alderman is prohibiting multifamily. The developers want to put multifamily in there, and the, and the um, alderman is prohibiting it. So our next question is, okay, well, what's the zoning? We found out it was zoned industrial, and under the city of Chicago, industrial permits self-storage. And we're like, check, ding. Um, why is the alderman prohibiting it? He doesn't want higher density. Well, self-storage doesn't add any density, doesn't require much parking. So check, ding. I mean, and then we really started digging into this in terms of, like, what was the market saturation? And we began looking at it, and, you know, within three miles, there's over 500,000 people, of which 66% of them are renters. Well, that is like a huge bingo on for self-storage. And then we looked closer, we saw that the saturation level where supply equals demand typically in that market in the city of Chicago is like seven square feet of lockers per capita. And this facility was like under two. So we're like, holy cow, this is like a great deal for us. So then it just became a matter of could we get the configuration, you know, would the pricing work, would the structures work and stuff like that. And so, but you know, we bought the building, we bought it for like $22 a square foot. I, I can't build that building for $22 a square foot. And so it just began clicking and hitting all of the criteria that we needed in, in terms of, you know, what what are the requirements. And granted, did we stumble into it? Yeah, I would have to say that we stumbled into it because of the fact that, you know, I'm telling people what I'm doing and then therefore someone brought me a deal. And I think that's, you know, the, a big lesson is don't be afraid to talk about what you're doing because you never know where a deal is going to come from. So let's stay on that one a moment. I, you mentioned something I'm not familiar with, the, the square foot per capita. Uh, what is the average size of a storage unit? And I assume you're talking about, you know, uh, that two square feet is two square feet of available storage per person in that operating zone, if you will, or am I kind of off base there? So the, the saturation level is the, the amount of square footage of locker with per capita. So, if you're where supply equals demand is seven square feet of locker per capita. So if you're if we're above that, so if let's say we're at eight or nine, that means our rental rates are going to be um, decreased and our absorption rate is going to take longer because there's too much product in the marketplace. So the fact that we're we're the supply is below the demand index, that means we should be able to command a better rent and we'll be faster to lease it up. And so when we're at two square feet per capita, that means, you know, there's there's growth ability for us to expand within the marketplace without hitting that saturation level, which is the, the biggest thing that one of one of the biggest things that we look for when we evaluate a site. So every potential site, we will do um, market demographic analysis of it and eventually order a full feasibility report on that three to five mile radius of that property. Um, it doesn't matter if we're four or five miles away and there, we, we think that there's an existing facility, we will order it for that specific site because we want to know what's going on specifically in that marketplace. And so when we looked at that one, we're like, holy cow, this is really good. This is incredibly low. We have the confidence that we could lease this thing up aggressively. So we opened up the doors the week before Pritzker shut down the state with COVID. And in six months, we're at 30, over 30% occupancy when we were only supposed to be at 18% occupancy because you're supposed to be nice. 3% per month in, in lease up. But because there's such strong demographics there, we're at 30% occupancy. And that, that's an example of how if we were too high in that market saturation, we would, there, we would not be able to hit that 30%. Interesting. So you're in a, you're in a few other markets too, not just Chicago. I'm curious that when COVID did hit or if you're seeing any kind of a difference, we're like six months into, uh, eviction moratoriums, foreclosure moratoriums. I'm wondering how much of an impact does the restriction of those kind of like life changing events where someone might be forced to get self storage? Has that negatively impacted any of your inventory or have you kind of not really noticed any, you know, uh, increase or decrease in the, the rate of lease up, leasing altogether? Well, typically self-storage actually 
performs very well in a recessionary market. In fact, we did a whole webinar for our investors about the impact of COVID and what are the, you know, assuming that the economy was going to go into a recession. And depending on whether you listened to the debate last night, we're either in an L or a K shape recovery or V. And I don't really know what those, what a K shape recovery looks like, but <laughs> either way. It's an interesting um, one. Yeah. <laughs> either way, what happens historically within recessionary markets with self storage is we've seen a 1% drop. And then within the next year after that to two years, we see a rebound up to two or 3% increase in continued growth. So we, we deemed it recessionary resistant. We went back and looked at the recessions back from 1991 to 01 to 08, 09. We, we looked at all of them and we saw that same pattern there. And the reason is that people downsize, there's divorce, there's dislocation, there's displacement, all these different things that they have to go through where there's a tremendous amount of change in someone's life and they're, they're going through a lot of hardship and it's easier to address the, the, the difficulties in their life by putting stuff into self storage so they get time to recover, to reflect, to adjust, you know, reassess what their needs are going to be. And so that is one reason why in a recessionary market self storage does well is because people resist change, you know, and, you know, it's sort of like that, that, you know, you put a lobster in a pot and you, you turn on the water and it boils, you know, people sort of forget, you know, it's the same sort of effect. People tend to forget that they have this stuff in self storage and they might not say, okay, now I feel good about it. I'm going to go back and look at this. So during our COVID period of time out and I'll knock on my wood desk here is that we kept all of our facilities either operational or uh, under construction. And we did not have one person come down with COVID at any of our locations. And we were in um, Wisconsin, Illinois, as well as Ohio. And so, you know, it is, we've made adjustments with social distancing. We've taken necessary precautionary measures. Um, but we, you know, as I said, we saw our one facility in, in Chicago on, on the Lawndale, you know, go to 30% occupancy, which, at first, Keysmart said, hey, look, we want to shut down the doors here. And I said, no, you know, I've read the order. We're considered essential. There's no reason why we need to be closed. In fact, we need to be open to help people during this period of time. And so they made an exception for our facility. And then within a week, they kept all the facilities in Chicago open. Nice. Do you think that the 1% drop that would be recorded in that, like, first year that the recession comes – do you think that's kind of the, the leftover where, you know, we're sort of at like the top of the bubble, if you will, where like unemployment's really low. So like employment's really high. Is that like uh there's not as much demand because it's like kind of the last little hurrah of the good marketplace before the disruption and the, uh you know, the divorce and the displacement and all those things kind of settle in as job loss and unemployment runs out. And like we're expecting probably a year from now if these stimulus packages dry up and a lot of these businesses continue to close. You know, one of the theories out here economically is that there's probably a little bit of a danger zone coming next year with all of the job loss and could potentially create that 2 to 3%. So do you think my hypothesis on the 1% drop in demand there comes from sort of that, like, leftover euphoria and stability of the prior boom period or maybe not? I, I think the drop might be in the – in. I mean, there's two things. That, if I just take what happened in the most recent situation, um, you know, being part of a, a mastermind of self storage operators across the country, as well as being in the self storage association, at first everyone said, don't evict anybody. You know, like it, it just not that people were like itching to do that, but it was just like, hey, let's let's just have a policy across the board not to evict anyone. And obviously, in the in the apartment market, you know there was legal orders decreeing that people couldn't lose their home during this period of time. You know, there, there, no judge was really thinking about the self storage. So we were sort of under the radar with that, but you know, common sense just said, Hey, look, let's, let's work with people rather than hurting people. And, you know, that was our position as well as like, we, we offered economic incentive programs rather than COVID. We wanted it to make it positive and said, we're, we're giving you an economic incentive versus a, a negativity set type thing. So in that case, um, occupancy didn't drop. It was held. And if anything, what people did is they say, hey, look, if, if since you're not paying, I'm going to pay you to leave. 
so that they could free it up for someone else who was paying. But every operator that I talked to did not see a drop in occupancy. They saw a 1% to 2% increase in delayed collections, but that was about it. <clears throat> so what is exactly the reason why it drops? It might be because of the fact that um, someone has to, you know, perhaps move or business shuts down. I mean, half of our, uh, our clients are businesses, and especially in the Chicago one. The first people that rented from us were, were businesses, and they, they took our biggest units so they could store their equipment. Um, and so it might be that because the business is shut down, that's where you have your drop. But, but as people, you know, figure out what they're going to do, then they put stuff in there, which is raises the, the, the level back up again. Yeah, it makes, that makes sense. So switching gears back to Lawndale, any one of the other um, projects that you've done recently. But as an example, would you mind talking about kind of the capital structure? How do you fund it? How do you purchase it? How do you finance repairs? Where are the investors falling in there if you're raising private equity to fund these things? Um, you know, the details that somebody maybe investing in one of your deals would like to hear about. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take our, our Toledo one because that's one I'm really proud of in terms of our capital stack. Um, we found out when we were under contract that it was in an opportunity zone. And when I first learned that it was in an opportunity zone, I had literally no idea what that meant. And I think, like most people, it's because it was a brand new term. It had been out less than seven months in terms of what the definition was. And so, as I began looking into this, I'm like, hmm, this could be a real economic incentive for our investors. And so, we we put out an email to our investors saying, we're in an opportunity zone. Granted, we don't know exactly what this means, but if this is of interest to people, we will do this on your behalf to figure out how we can, you know, work within this capital stack to assist you. And we had three people raise their hands, come forward and say, yes, we definitely want to be in an opportunity fund if you can facilitate that. And so I was literally on the phone with the IRS trying to figure out, because if you look in the tax code, it was literally like three quarters of a page. And it was like reference this form. And then you click at the form and the form didn't exist. So it's like impossible to figure this thing out because it was written in the Obama administration, but it didn't get implemented until the Trump administration. But if anyone is familiar with how taxes become, I mean, how laws become, you know, in effect, Congress puts it out there, but then they put it to the Treasury to try to figure out how to implement it. So the Treasury comes back to Congress and say, hey, here's what our recommendations for our regulations for how we think we are going to implement these laws that you're telling us that we have to enact. And then Congress goes, yeah, that sounds good. Or how about this? And then they change it again. And then that's how it becomes law. And so we, we were in that nebulous area between the time that it had been enacted into law, but the regulations hadn't come out. So I'm literally on the phone with the IRS um, trying to figure out how this this entity is going to work. So we, we typically have around, you know, you know, conservatively 30 to 35 percent equity that we work with investors, you know, investors that have done multiple deals with us or people that have come to us and say, hey, look, we'd like to participate with you. And then we'd fill the rest with debt. Now, on this deal, we were 15% equity, 15% pace financing, which is another equity structure, sort of like a MES, MES type structure. But then within our 15% equity, we also had um, people that were in an opportunity, opportunity zone fund, which we created for them. And so they invested in the fund and then the fund, which, which were the managers, which we do for free for them, then invest in the project. And so we were probably the first opportunity zone fund paced, privately funded paced project. I know in Ohio, if not the country with the, with the layering of those two capital stacks. And so with the pace financing, we're able to increase the rate of return for our investors because we don't have to raise as much equity. And then we also have the tax shelter um, within the opportunity zones. And so it's a, it's a very nice structure that we were able to put together for our moment. And that's where I find the creativity of putting the deal comes together for us is when we can structure things like that. So on that deal there, was the other 70% a, like a standard bank loan? It was a it was a collaboration of credit unions, and so the, the the company that we work with sort of acts as a mediator or a facilitator for 
credit unions. So we have one main credit union, and then there's nine other credit unions that all contribute to the debt. And so all our communication is through that first entity, but technically our loan documents have a different credit union behind it. Gotcha. And if I were putting in on that deal and I was buying in for the 15%, what does any profit sharing look like, you know, uh, potential returns look like for the investors who were walking into that deal? Well, so each member gets a each share. So we said one, the one share is $100,000. They get a percentage of the company. And so the way in which we structure it is that we want to be as open book and transparent as possible. So rather than having these complex waterfalls and these different structures and all this sort of stuff, we just do a straight split. You know, we don't get paid until you get paid. So that way our interests are aligned. And so we, we really want to make sure that our focus is the same as our investors, so that we're not accused of, like, holding on to a project too long because we're making this annualized fee off of it when to the detriment of our investors. That's not our objective. That's not our goal. And so with a development project, we won't go into – a project unless we have modeled it out to be over 20%. That was one of the first rules that I learned when working for Optima, that based upon the level of risk, that development should be over 20% um, return to in order to proceed or go forward. So that is a, a, that is a system, that is a guideline that I've, you know, held to for the past, you know, we're over 20 years within CODA. I started in 98 and, uh, you know, I started in real estate back in 1991. So, you know, over that 30-year period of time, that's a rule that we've been adhering to for that period of time. And that's return on in capital, uh, return on investment for the capital portion, correct? Well, it's that, but it's also, I mean, we with with uh, self storage, but we're also getting the cash flow. So once we begin getting cash flow, that all uh, gets added into the net return to the investor. So we're, we're looking both at appreciation as well as uh, annualized cash flow. Gotcha. Do you guys do like a 70-30 split as the operator long-term there? Um, it, it varies from project to project. So, any, you know, we'll, we'll range anywhere from 45 to 60% splits, depending on what the structure is and what the level of risk is and, and how we can structure the deal. So we look at each deal individually because we want to make sure that we're hitting those milestones. Um, you know, when when people compare us, to other investments, and we've had them compared like to other apartment syndications or, you know, type of raises. Um, they say, well, I get 80% of the deal here. And I'm like, okay, well, what's your projected rate of return? They're like, well, 12%. I'm like, well, they're giving you 80% because they, they, in order to get you up to 12%, <laughs> you know, and you're, you're complaining that you're getting 40 or 55 or 50% on ours, but you're getting over 20%. So inherently, which one is more risky? The one that has to give you 80 to give you 12 or ours where, you know, we have to, we don't have to give you as much and we have a higher rate of return. So I, that's where I always focus, tell our, you know, our investors, don't focus on the percent. Look at what the overall rate of return is and the level of risk of what we're doing. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Would you mind touching on the pace financing and why that's such an attractive, unique and innovative piece of the capital stack, Scott? It's through the Department of Energy. And it's a program that's implemented at the state level. So there's certain states that have adopted PACE and certain states that have not. But then it's administered locally. So in, in that sense, it's very much like the opportunity zones where, you know, they, they are all re, um, implemented and de designated on a very local level, but it's a federal program. And so within that, what the – what the federal law say is that if you look to increase the energy performance of a building, those dollar amounts can be applied through PACE financing. And so that concept is, what it, let's just call it a million dollars, okay? Up, you can go up to 20% of the value of the building. We can't do that because we, we just literally can't spend enough on energy improvement stuff. Okay, we're typically capped out about a million dollars, which is why I said a million dollars. So new roof, new HVAC, new electrical. We don't really have a high demand for plumbing because unlike apartments, which are, you know, hmm. lots of toilets and sinks and, and, you know, things that cause problems in the middle of the night, you know, self-storage is an apartment without toilets, without a kitchen. You know, we have like three bathrooms. 
um, in our facilities. We don't have like, you know, 300 bathrooms. So when we're looking at those, those things don't help us, but elevators, uh, glass, windows, insulation, any of those improvements, if we can show that we're enhancing the economic performance of the building in terms of utilities, we can offset that through PACE financing. So it, what PACE financing then does is either through the local level, through the Port Authority, or private ventures, they take that amount, they amateurize it over the lifespan of the useful life of that equipment, and they put a low interest rate on it, you know, like a bond rate. And instead of it being paid um, below the line item as a, as a, um, a mortgage, it is applied as a special assessment to the taxes. And so as a result of it, it's above the line item, and then you pay it through your taxes twice a year or however frequently the local municipality collects taxes. And so they will amortize that payment, and it gets, you, you know, instead of paying it every month, you're paying it every six months. And because of that, the banks view it as equity because it is not, it doesn't have a mortgage on the property. It's a special assessment to the taxes. So that way it's considered equity versus a debt instrument. So therefore you don't have to raise as much capital. Yeah, it's kind of mind blowing. I, I'm sure people are listening and are going to have to re rewind that for a minute, but that's why essentially on that deal in Toledo, we're talking about 15, it's like 15% down really and then you got 85 percent financing and that's also a development loan is that like a permanent development loan that converts once the construction's done well the the, the, the main portion is 70 percent of the loan i meant not not the pace portion yeah the 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 70 percent is converted from a, a construction to permanent on the backside. yes interesting <laughs> so that said, are you now on the hunt for more of these uh, specific pace financing things? Would that drive your lens as you're focusing around, you know, Coda, looking for additional opportunities, or is it kind of like a nice have, like an opportunity zone? Maybe it's a nice have, and it makes the job a little easier, and, and the pace is the same way. Or are you now starting to focus on these unique uh, opportunities that are sort of mandated through federal programs? Uh, we see that we see both of these things as grading. So first and foremost, the deal's got to make sense in of itself. And if we if we don't have those tools or those resources, the deal has still got to work on its own. So if we can layer in pace, if we can if we're in an opportunity zone, we only view that as bonus gravy material. So for instance, when we were the project that we're going to now, the project that we're we're under contract for is in Louisville, Kentucky, and it's not Louisville, so when my dad's like, where's Louisville? I'm like, it's Louisville, Dad, but down there they say Louisville. So we we recognize that if we're not going to be accepted as outsiders, we need to learn how to pronounce the city. So <laughs> Louisville, Kentucky. And, you know, for us, we could do historic tax credits on that. We could do PACE financing on that one, and we were in an opportunity zone. So it was like the hidden gem of all these things, and we're buying the building for $13 a square foot. You know, so it was even, you know, bigger gravy for us. It's a 144,000 square foot building. And we're actually going to have flex warehouse space tenants on one side, and we're going to have self storage on the other, just because the market doesn't demand 144,000 square feet of self storage. It demands about 80, but there's already tenants there. So we'll have income coming in during the entire process, which is a, another bonus for us. And so when we were looking at that, if, if we're comparing two properties, this one is going to be like 10 times more interesting to us than the other one because we have all these different ways in which we can structure the capital stack to increase our investors' rate of return without taking on any additional risk. And that's the biggest thing we look for is like, how can we add value to a property beyond just the rate of return? So we'll look at cost segregation. We'll look at historic tax credits. We're, we're getting like $1.5 million of historic tax credits on our property up in Wisconsin that we just opened up. Uh, the pace financing and the opportunity zones. I mean, our investors get a 30% bump in their tax return because of the fact that they're, you know, diminishing or eliminating their capital gain taxes 30%. So, you know, they love that. The fact that we can just create a shelter for them, you know, and, you know, it, it, you know, not to take political sides last night, but, you know, everyone was bashing President Trump because of the fact that he paid X amount of money for um, taxes. 
and, you know, my kids were talking about that. I'm like, look, I do the same things. I'm like, that's the whole point of real estate. That's why I'm in real estate mm-hmm. is to shelter income. I mean, it's one of the greatest tools that we have. So we'll, let's not complain about it, but like understand why we're doing what we're doing because ultimately do I, am I cutting my federal taxes? Yes. But if you look at it, like how many other ways am I contributing back to society because I'm investing, I'm developing, I'm creating jobs, I'm doing all these other things which have ripple effects, which enhance our society. There's other ways in which we're contributing to society. But as a respect to that, that's where Congress said, hey, look, we want to incentivize people to do these things, and this is how we're going to do it. And that's a, no different than the opportunity zones, which was created by the Obama administration. And so that's what I'm saying. Like the opportunity zone, people think it's a Trump thing. It's really an Obama thing. And but he, Obama just never put it into play because he didn't think he didn't see the true value of it, and it only came to play uh, once Trump became in the office. So it's uh, Steve Glickman, the guy who created it, was in the Obama administration. Yeah, and like like you said, I mean, there's a lot of controversy around the opportunity zones, and it's a lot of headline grabbing and stuff, a lot of pol- political stuff that we see. But I think the challenge of the opportunity zone not behaving like pouring fire on gasoline in the, in the terms of, you know, attracting humongous amounts of investment in these marginalized areas, Scott, is more that, you know, m- most of the people who are investing capital in these areas – like yourself, say, hey, Opportunity Zone, Pace, that's gravy. The deal still has to make sense. And there's some neighborhoods where the deals just simply don't make sense uh, now, anytime soon, even though they are Opportunity Zone. So I, I think I think it is a good policy, and I think that the tax code, you know, depreciation and the, the Opportunity Zones and things of that nature to help federal tax returns get nice and low, which all of the listeners would likely agree with, uh, that's why we're in real estate. Um, but the bottom line is, like, the, the neighbors, the neighborhood still has to make economic sense in, in order to make that happen. Um, so the Opportunity Absolutely. Zone, as an example, I do want to ask you a question because you're the first person that I've actually had on the show who's raised money using an Opportunity Zone and had a warm reception from their investors and actually had money invested on behalf. So I'm assuming you might have one anecdotal yet anonymous story of somebody reaping a gain off the top. Maybe they sold a big, you know, stock position to to move the money into here or, you know, like what was the capital gain that they timed perfectly or does it not necessarily have to come from like I sold my Facebook stock this year and then I put that into Scott's deal this year? Like, like, can you just touch on an example so I can actually hear it happening? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, to touch base on your first point as well, is like when we were interacting with the, the uh, city of Toledo, they're like, well, the only reason why you bought this property is because you got it real cheap. And I said, well, I, I disagree with that because the seller of the property was very happy with the amount of money that I paid him. In fact, so happy that he sold it to me, right? If, if, if it was a bad deal for him, he would not have sold it to me. But on the flip side, let me be clear. It wasn't because it was an opportunity zone that I'm investing here. It was because the market economics demanded my product. If that demand was not there, I don't care how much incentives there was going to be. I was never going to invest in this location. So you have to have the economics behind it in order to make it work. And, you know, they they didn't appreciate that fact. So that's an example of literally Mm -hmm. talking to, you know, municipal officials saying, like, hey, look, guys, this isn't something you can just like roll over on me because you think I'm just a greedy developer. No, it has to make economic sense. And there's a limit to what I can do because otherwise it just doesn't make sense. On the flip side, to answer the second part of your question, we had, uh, we have an investor who is already a self storage operator and he sold his facility and he was considering doing a 1031 exchange and he, and he had substantial amount of capital gains because of it, because he bought, this, you know, let's just say it underperforming. And he got it performing, he expanded, and he had a significant amount of capital gains on this. Well, in a 1031, you have to go into a like entity within, you have to identify it within 40 days and you have to place it within 90 days or, you know, that's the general parameters of it. But if you think about it, when you sell a property or when you sell a stock, you don't know exactly what your capital gains are for the year because you might have pluses and you might have minuses. So the only t- true time that you really have to understand exactly what your capital gains are is probably 
March 15th or definitively by April 15th. So if you sell a property in January of, let's say, 2019, you don't know what your, your, your capital gains are until April of 2020. So where in this case, it was even extended till June. In both those cases, the federal government came out and said, hey, look, we can't, it's not a capital gain by transaction. It's a capital gain on your tax return. So if you sell a property in January 1, we're going to give you all the way until June of the following year to identify a zone or a property that you want to place it into. So if you compare that to a 1031, there's an incredible lot more flexibility because in addition, you don't even have to go into a like entity. With a 1031, if if it's LLC 123, then you have to have a similar type structure for that new property that you buy. You can't change it. So our investor said, hey, look, one, I don't want to necessarily be forced into the same product type because, two, I like what you're doing, but I can join it as an LLC versus having to do this on my own. And it gave me time to figure out where I really wanted to place my money. So he took some of the money and put it with us. And he did took some of his money and did something else with it. You know, he didn't tell me exactly all the different things that he did with it, but he didn't have to allocate it all into one location. So it gave him a tremendous amount of more flexibility, both in the time frame as well as the how he could place it. And that's why he chose to invest in our opportunity zone. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I I guess the last time I've researched, it was probably around when you were putting your first one together there, and there was no information available. Uh, to actually get the details. But, I mean, in theory, then, I could sell, say, two or three rental properties if they were single family, you know, a gain of 30000 on each one, and then I could invest that whole 120000 bucks into an Opportunity Zone qualified fund, and it's kind of like more the the tax, the capital gain line item on the tax return is really – uh, the the limiting factor or the, the number that's available. It's not, you know, oh, I sold the property for the 1031. So I I see the flexibility that that actually is that actually is a good program. Yeah, I mean, the negative is the duration that you have to hold it, right? But if Steve Glickman says, well, okay, let's say you don't want to go to 10 years. Let's say you go three years. Well, you just deferred your taxes for three years. So worst case, you're deferring your taxes. Best case is you're wiping them out. Yeah, and if you're if you're only deferring them, you still had this larger deferred principal, which went to work earning returns for that three year period. So you're ahead since the seed was larger when you invested it than having had paid the taxes and invested seventy percent or whatever rate that you happen to be at at the time. Absolutely. Cool. So, are there any books that you recommend, maybe to investors, maybe to people on your team, maybe impactful books that you've read, maybe one or two? Here, Scott? Well, again, if you recall the beginning of the conversation, um, which I've really enjoyed, so, and because we've gotten into a bunch of different things, is I look at transformational things rather than transactional things. So a lot of my reading has to evaluate, like, how am I, what's my, you know, mental, physical, spiritual composition and how my makeup and how I interact with different people. So one of them was like The Road Back to You um, by Ian Morgan Crone. Different spelling, no relation. I'm not plugging my family's book, um, <laughs> but the the it's it's a, it's based upon the Enneagram, which is a, a tremendously powerful concept developed by fourth century monks that breaks personality types into different things, and it's incredibly insightful. And everybody in our company um, has worked within understanding their own Enneagram type, and it impacts how we communicate. It also impacts how we interact with our customers, our investors, everybody. Um, which has been very powerful. More recently, I've been reading uh, Journey, uh, Invitation to a Journey by Robert Mulholland. And again, it, it, it's more transformational. And what I like about it is it begins the book by describing like we're, we are such so much into the immediate now society uh, culture that if we, we go to a webinar, we go to a seminar, we hear a podcast, we think that it has to be, you know, change has to become immediate as opposed to allowing it to marinate, grow organically and naturally. And, you know, it takes time. And that's the thing is that when we look at our strategies, when we're looking at what we're doing, we're not trying to be the, the instant coffee or the instant cereal. We're looking at like this is this is going to marinate and take time. And we're going to see changes over a long period of time, which are going to have a bigger and deeper profound impact than something that's more immediate. 
And that's, that's one of the reasons why I like that book is it's like, it's forcing me to look deep to see how, okay, what areas that I need to be focusing on for longer term change and growth. Nice. Uh, Scott, do you have any hobbies or interests outside of real estate that might surprise listeners? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, you know, for, for, uh, I'd say 20 years, my, my hobby was my kids, which probably not surprise people, but, you know, we really focus on, you know, enjoying things that they could enjoy that they could learn to do proficiently. And so whatever they chose to do, we try to get behind them, encourage and support them, which obviously took a lot of great deal of time. Some of the things I enjoy doing, um, personally, um, which I believe I need to set up our, we we're blessed to live, you know, a few blocks from the lake, a really big lake. So that gives us an opportunity to do water activities. So we like to paddle, we like to sail. Um, you know, we, we like to just have fun out on the lake. Um, but I also like, you know, skiing and playing hockey myself. And so those are the things where I, which I do to rejuvenate myself and, and to keep active and, and try to keep, you know, my, my midsection down as low as possible, which, you know, it's a, it's a daily struggle. So that's, that's where I try to enjoy. <laughs> yeah. The never ending struggle. I, I live on the lake and I look out the window of the office here all day long and I see the boats and everything. Oh yeah. I need to get a boat. I talk myself out of it every time. If I, if I need to, I go down and I rent a jet ski, like uh Montrose beach or one of them, or, you know, rent the uh, kayaks and go out on the river. But it is cool. It's a cool city here. Our, our plug together, Scott for Chicago here. <laughs> well, we'll have to have you up. I mean, it's a little late. I, mean, I was paddle boarding this morning, um, but we'll, we'll have to have you up this uh, coming summer and get you out on the lake and we'll, we can enjoy all those things at one time. So we don't have a big boat. We, you know, we just have a modest, boat but it's right on the beach and we keep all of our stuff right down there and you know we're we can enjoy it within 20 minutes which is the nice part nice nice so if you could go back and share the crown jewel of wisdom with yourself back in 1991 uh what would that be well back in 1991 i mean i was like probably you know either as i mentioned either dumb enough to not or ignorant enough or arrogant enough to not really know what i didn't know (laughs) Um, but you know, un, unbridled confidence is probably what the best way to describe it. But you know, the, the reason why I, I mentioned that book is that if I had, had that understanding of, of how to understand where people are coming from and, and their different personality types, I think it would have helped me tremendously more younger in my career in life. I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, our director of construction was working with a client and he was growing incredibly frustrated because you know, a lot of times when we give clients, uh, when we're interacting with them, I, I, I would tell them like, hey, give them like three or four choices, you know, give, give them in the general direction, because if you give them too many, they become overwhelmed and they can't make a decision. So help them out. You know what they want. Try to give them like three or four resources. And this one client is like, I've given her the three or four resources, but she won't make a decision and the project's coming to a halt. Like, what do I do? And I said, <clears throat> she's grinding on it. I, I, I bet she's a five in intellect and she needs to, you know, her fears analysis by paralysis. So rather than limiting her things, give her every selection possible, tell her where to look for every single thing that she could possibly think of and see if that alters it. He he said in a week later, he goes, you know what? I did that. And she's like making decisions like crazy now because it, it was her ability to choose what was right versus like being forced where in her mind, she's being forced to do that. And it was like a powerful message was not only to him, but to me, it's like, if we had treated her like every single client, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. But because we could understand her personality type, which was the exact same as his, you know, that, that was what was really funny about it. We were able to keep the job going and keep, you know, profit margins healthy and stuff because obviously the more time we spend on it, we lose money because, you know, we want to build efficiently because time is money. That's the greatest value that we have. The greatest asset is our time. And if, if I need to be, you know, how much do I value that time and how much do I put a priority to that time? And so that's, that's the biggest thing that we take away is how can we be more efficient with our time? Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the, uh, anagram. If I said that right, uh, checking out myself in the last year or so, I've, begun to pay more attention to the personality types and do the tests. 
uh, at the prodding of some of my partners who've been doing it for years and getting just dramatically fantastic results in the positions that they're in. These guys who have sort of taken a scientific study approach to personality type at a very young age, the guys I'm talking about who are on my team. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm embracing that now. I'm looking forward to that same that same leveraging of efficiency with our time by maximizing our relationships, if you will. So great crown jewel there. So Scott, how can listeners get more information about you or Coda Management Group? Well, first of all, what I'd like to say again is thank you so much for having us. And and what I'd like to offer, give back to your community, your group, is if if anyone is interested, like they feel they have a property that they want to learn more about self storage or they think it might make a great self storage opportunity. If they email us at info at coda, C-O-D-A, M-G dot com, um, I promise we're not going to steal it. That's not, that's not our business model. It, our, our industry is too small for that. We will, and they mention your show on this, on the, on the subject line or in the box for our website. We will give your listeners an hour to go through it, help them explain it. We'll also give them a feasibility study. So that they can understand and there's a, there's a wealth of information in the feasibility study because it's not just that location, but it talks about self storage as a whole. We will give them both of those things, um, as a, as a thank you for having us on your show. Um, but our website is coda, C-O-D-A-M-G.com for management group, or if you email us at coda, info at coda, M-G.com, it will get to us and either myself or our director of sales and acquisition, Martin. We'll uh, take the time to go through it with you, and, and we'll, we'll go or your clients or your your listeners. So, well, uh, that's our gift to you guys. Nice, good deal. Make sure you mention the REI Diamond Show, uh, Scott. Hey, wonderful time. I got pages of notes here. Intriguing conversation. Love the business model. Love the properties that you put together. I really had a good time and enjoy the show, and I appreciate you blocking out and, and giving us the time and giving us your wisdom. So, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks again, Dan, for having us. I appreciate it. And thank you for tuning in to this episode of the REI Diamond Show. Remember to review and subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcasting app. Just search REI Diamonds and click subscribe. You can sign up to receive new episode notification emails at reidiamonds.com, as well as check out the 166 episode archive of wealth building, real estate investment, jewels of wisdom. I've made millions of dollars by using the wisdom and ideas shared on this show over the last few years, and maybe you can too. That website again is reidiamonds.com. So my main business is buying and selling houses. 223 houses bought and sold in 2019. And 186 houses bought and sold so far in 2020. And we have another 139 houses in inventory, either under construction, for sale, or sold and awaiting closing. So here are three ways that you and I can do business. Number one, if you buy houses and you want to buy houses at wholesale prices in Atlanta, Chicago, or the Philadelphia region, Go to dealswithroi.com and sign up for the correct buyers list. Note that there are five lists in total separated by region. Number two, if you are an accredited investor and you'd like to fund a deal or fund many deals, go to fundrehabdeals.com and sign up to receive private mortgage investment opportunity emails. And number three, if you have a deal for sale in either Atlanta, Chicago, or the Philadelphia region, please send me an email directly with the details. I buy fix and flip deals on single family houses, and I will buy turnkey multifamily rentals occupied with tenants. And that brings us to the conclusion of this episode. Next up. Ardor SEO founder Chris Reed joins us from the other side of the world to talk about driving huge traffic from Google to your website at no cost. Sound like a good idea? Another good idea is making sure you don't miss it. Anyway, that's a wrap, my friend. I'm done. Thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin. 
To receive email notifications of new weekly episodes, sign up at www.reidiamonds.com.